Classy coders, it's Prof G, and in this lesson, we'll get a solid introduction to classes in Swift. We'll create classes. We'll work with arrays of classes, class initializers, and point out what it really means that classes are reference types. And after we're done, we'll be in good shape to apply what we've learned in our to-do list app in Swift UI. To quote Ron Burgundy, stay classy, Swifters, and let's learn big. So for those who've stumbled across this video out of sequence, you can follow along to learn about classes in Swift. We're going to be hopping into an Xcode playground in just a minute, but as a setup, this is how we got here from the earlier lessons in the playlist. We've been building a to-do list application. It has a decent user interface, but it doesn't work with actual data. We can't add or edit any to-do list items. Also, if we take a look at our detail view, we've got five separate state variables for each to-do item. That's ugly and unworkable. There's got to be a better way to do this, and there is, when we use classes in Swift and then incorporate them into Swift UI. To the playground! File, New Playground, and I'm going to call this playground Classes in Swift. And the first thing I'm going to do is to repeat part of the mess that we just looked at in order to illustrate how superior it will be when we work with classes. So let's create a subset of data to keep track of a to-do list item. We'll create a var item and set this equal to the string learn Swift. Var due date, set this equal to date.now, and var completed is equal to false. So we've got a string, a date, and a bool to keep track of. Now one question we have is how do we keep track of multiple to-dos? Well, we could create three separate arrays like this. Var items, plural with an S, colon, square brackets with string in the middle to declare this as an array of strings, and set this equal to empty square brackets. And similarly, var due dates, again plural with an S, colon, brackets with date in between, equals, empty brackets, and var completeds, plural, colon, brackets with bool in between, equals, empty brackets. So now we've got three arrays for three pieces of data that we want to keep track of. So let's add some data. With this approach, to add one to-do item, we need to update three separate values in three separate arrays, like this. Items.append, in parentheses, item. Due dates dot append in parentheses, due date. And completeds.append, in parentheses, completed. And let's add another item, this time by appending literals to each of the arrays. So items.append, and we'll pass in the string second to-do item, build apps. Do dates dot append passing in, oh, how about capital D date dot now plus 60 times 60 times 24. So that's one day from now since these numbers are all seconds multiplied by one another. And completeds dot append passing in false. So here's part of the problem. If we want to update our data, we need to be sure which element we're updating because if we get this wrong, then potentially all three arrays are out of sync with bad data. I could update, say, completeds, the array, in brackets 1, so it's equal to true, but imagine getting a due date or a completed flag on an incorrect item and missing, say, a big date or an interview. Gack! Too risky. And what if we need to remove an item? Let's say item at index 0. Well, if we need to do this, then there are three arrays we need to change in three different places. Items.remove at 0, due dates.remove at 0, and completeds.remove at 0. Miss deleting a proper element from one of these arrays, and you'll get an index out of range error at all sorts of odd spots in your program. Not at all good. Well, with it clear that having multiple arrays is problematic, it's time for classes to the rescue. So remember, when we create classes, we're creating our own custom types, and these can be designed to contain multiple properties of any type inside them. For example, a person class might include properties for first name and last name, which are strings, and age, which might be an int. Classes can even include their own functions, which are called methods, when they're part of a class. In a later lesson, we'll also learn about a similar way to create custom data types, structs, but we need classes for Swift data, so we're introducing that topic now. But for now, we'll start our class with the keyword class, lowercase. Then we give our class a name, and since classes are types, the convention is to use upper camel case. Forget to do this during a job interview, and you'll seem like an unskilled noob, and that's not you. So let's call this to do, capital T-O, capital D-O, and our entire class definition will be enclosed within curlies. Now inside, let's declare these properties like this, var item colon string. Now notice that I'm using lower camel case since the properties are values, variables in this case, and the convention is for variables to use lower camel case. And also note that in this particular case, we're declaring but not initializing the values. And then below this we'll say var due date colon date and var is completed colon bool. 
Now also note that we're getting an error that says this class has no initializers. Now initializers are the factory methods that create variables from the blueprint that is the class. So now if we have uninitialized values and we've got three of them, our three properties up here, then we need to create an initializer. So if we click on the error circle, Xcode complains all three of these properties in our class, these three values here aren't initialized. So we need an initializer, a special function that determines how to create a new value with all of the uninitialized properties needed for this class. Now Xcode makes it super easy to create an initializer. Just above the closing curly for the class, we start typing the word init, I-N-I-T in lowercase, and code completion presents us with this option with all of the uninitialized values listed after the word init. We'll press return on this and the initializer is created. Now here's how the class code works. So init is actually a function and it looks weird because it doesn't have the standard func keyword in front of it and it doesn't have a function name. It just says init. But when we create a new object from this class and let's do that now by setting up a new variable var and we'll call this variable a to do item, which is going to hold a variable, which is an object of our class. So we'll set this equal to the class name to do capital T capital D. And we see code completion shows us an option with the three parameters after parentheses. Those are the same three parameters we have in our initializer up here. When we press return, we're going to pass in the three values for the properties we need to initialize. Item, due date, and is completed. So press return. Code completion writes our factory in the parentheses. And for item, I'll pass in the string learn classes. I'll tab over. And for the date, I'll pass in capital D date dot now. And then tab over. And for is completed, I'll pass in false. Now, when the code runs, these three input values are passed into the init function, and those are used to initialize or put values into the three uninitialized properties of the class, which is put into the variable named a to do item, the object created from the class. That's it. Nice. Now, when we create a value using this sort of data blueprint that we created, we say we're creating an instance of a value. Class refers to just the blueprint we define for a type in upper camel case, while instances of a class, the data we create using that blueprint, are referred to as objects. As a type, a class is written in upper camel case, and in most cases, the objects that are created that are instances of classes are stored in variables, and those are named using lower camel case. And now that we know how to create a single variable, an object using the class to do, let's create an array of to do items. So we do this just as if we were creating an array of any other type like string. We'll say var, give this variable a name, to do's with a plural, lower camel case, and we'll define this array with colon, square brackets, and in between the brackets we'll pass in to do capital T, capital D, that's our type. And because this is an array of type to do, each element in the array will contain all three to do properties. And we'll set this equal to empty square brackets so that the array initially has no elements. And now I can use this to enter to do's on a new line to do's lower camel case. And look at this code completion knows that this is an array of to do items. So it shows this type as to do in between square brackets. So press return to accept this. And since this is an array, we can use the dot append method and we can pass in that variable we just created, a to do item lower camel case. And look at this, code completion knows a to do item is of type to do. Press return, that's it. You've now got a single to do item in the to do's array. Let's add more. On a new line, we can also say to do's dot append and pass in a value by going directly to the to do factory by typing in upper camel case to do capital T capital D. And we can select the initializer with the three properties to define. Press return. Code completion says you want to create one of these. You need to pass in the values for these three properties. So we'll do that with learn Swift, a due date capital D of date dot now, and we'll set is completed to false. Now we've got two to do elements. Let's add some more. Same way to do's dot append. Enter capital T to do. Select the option with a three property initializer. Press return and we'll pass in build apps. How about a date of now plus 60 times 60 times 24. That's one day later is completed as false. And let's do another one to do's dot append pass in capital T to do take a vacation will be our string. And why don't we plan on taking that vacay 60 days in the future. So the date will be date dot now plus. Oh, wait, instead of calculating seconds, why don't we use the method that we learned in the prior lesson? So how about capital C calendar dot current dot date? This is a function. Select the option with three parameters by adding value and two. The calendar component is dot day. The value is 60 since we want 60 days in the future. And we're going to add the value to capital D date dot now. So today 
and we can delete the date.now plus in front of this since the calendar will automatically give us the calculation of 60 days from now. I need that vacay after all this YouTubing. And you might remember the error that we're getting is because this date function returns an optional. See the question mark in there? It could be nil. But we're going to force unwrap it with an exclamation point. I'm confident in my calculation. And let's not forget to set is completed to false. Now we use the append method for arrays above, but know that anything we can do with arrays, we can do with todos because that's an array too. So we have access to familiar methods like dot remove, which would delete an element from todos, getting rid of all three properties in an element at once, which is a big benefit over using three separate arrays like we showed earlier. We could also access the dot count property. Todos is a full member of the array club. Now below this, let's try to print out our to-dos array by saying print passing in to-dos, lower camel case. Shift return to execute our code. Gotta remember to click in the lower right corner to open the console. And yuck, look at that in the console. Now if you click to toggle the show result box in the attribute pane at the right, you can inspect the data inside the array. But that's not what we want. We want to print the contents of our array of objects, including the individual properties of each object. How do we do that? Well, we know how to print elements of an array, but, and my comment here should really ask the question like this, how do we access individual properties of an element of an array of structs? And the answer is correct, dot notation after the index. Let's see this in action by cleaning up our print. Why don't we loop through the to-dos on an index value like this. For index in zero, dot dot dot, to-dos, plural, dot count minus one, open and close curlies, and inside the curlies we'll say print, in between parens, in between double quotes, Item, colon, string interp, comma, space, completed colon, string interp, so we'll skip the due date in this print just to show that that's entirely okay too, and inside the first string interp, I'll enter to do's, plural, bracket, index, bracket, then enter dot notation, and yippity skippity, will you look at that? Our buddy code completion presents us with all of the properties we should have in a given element of to do. Nice. So let's select item, head over to the other string interp, and here we'll say to do's, again, plural, bracket, index, bracket, dot, and this time we'll select is completed. Shift return to run our code, and that looks much nicer. Now you know how to access individual properties in an array element using dot notation after an index. And I'm gonna comment out this ugly print up here. You don't need that anymore, skilled one. And shift return for a clean print, nice. And now let's try iterating through the array. So let's comment out the for loop that we just wrote and we use the same principles we know. Just use dot notation after the value that holds the iteration. So watch this. I'm gonna start to type for to do and look, before I've even finished to do, code completion pays attention to what I'm about to type. It takes a look at my variables and says, hey, if you're gonna type to do singular in here, I bet you wanna iterate through to do's plural. It offers to write all that code for me. I can press return to accept this and look at all this nice code that Xcode wrote for me. Sweetness. Now I have noticed this type of code completion is a little inconsistent in Xcode Playgrounds. It's very consistent in the Xcode editor. So if you didn't get this in code completion, you can just enter what I'm showing here for to do and to do's with curly braces. And inside those curlies we'll say print item colon string interp and comma space completed colon string interp. And here's the magic. In the last string interp we'll enter to do singular. That's the value that holds the individual element in each loop pass of the array we're iterating on. And after to do we say dot, we'll select is completed here. In the first string interp put in to do dot item, shift return. We see all four elements. Dot notation lets us access object properties while iterating through an array of objects. Now let's comment out this for loop. And while we're at it, why don't we show how we can use the for each array method and functional programming to do this with a single line of code. So we'll say to do's plural, the name of our array of objects, then dot for each with a capital E. Now we'll use the shorthand closure format here. So in between the parentheses, we'll type an open curly. Xcode will type the closing curly. And and what we put in between the curlies is what we want to execute each time we iterate through the array. So we'll say print in between parens and double quotes. How about my item colon string interp comma my date colon string interp. And inside the string interp at the end after my date, we'll say dollar sign zero. And remember that's a shorthand to represent each individual element as we go through the array. So we don't have to give this a formal variable name, but if we type in a dot, code completion knows that each element in this to-dos array is a to-do item and that it has these properties. So I'm gonna select due date here. And in the first string interp, I'll write dollar sign zero again, dot and select item. 
Shift return down below, and look at this. All four elements are printed, this time with our dates. Just one line of functional programming code using four each. Another useful skill in our Swifty utility belt. So now we can comment out this line with for each in it, and we can even add a method to a class and call that using any object of the class. Sort of like we did when we worked with enums in an earlier lesson. So let's scroll up here to where we define the to-do class. And remember, methods are just functions that are part of a type. So below the init function and above the last curly in the class, I'll enter func and I'll call this print to do lower camel case since that's the custom in Swift for functions. I'll enter open and close parens, not passing in any value, open and close curlies, and we'll enter our standard print line in here with print item colon string interp, comma space date colon string interp, comma space completed colon string interp. And then we can just straight up list the properties in here. Xcode should be showing the properties via code completion, but sometimes the Xcode playground is quirky, but I'll enter the names which should be identical to the property variables listed above, item, due date, and is completed. Then down below, I'll iterate through my to-dos with four, and as I start to type to-do, I can see that Xcode's offering to write all the code for me, so I'll press return, thank you Xcode, and we can call the method in the curlies by saying to-do, singular lower camel case, that value that holds the element we're iterating on, dot print to-do, code completion knows about our new method, nice, got a little M next to it for method, highlight that and press return, shift return down below to run this, and it works beautifully. So if you regularly think you're gonna use a block a code that's associated with a class. You can put a function inside the definition and it will be available as a method of any values of that type. So you got another belt notch for another Swifty skill. Now I'll comment out all the code that I've written so far and I'm gonna use the multi-line comment technique in Swift. So I'm gonna enter an asterisk slash just below the line where I want my comments to stop. Then I'm gonna scroll up top and I'm gonna enter a slash asterisk where I want my comments to start. Just make sure you do it under your import statement. You absolutely want that import statement in here. And everything between the slash asterisk and the asterisk slash is commented out. If I shift return with all my code commented out, the console down below will clear out. So before we illustrate this, how about a quick challenge? Why don't you create a class called person, capital P since it's a class, with two properties, first name and last name, which are both string types, and be sure to create its initializer too. So pause, give it a shot, you should be able to do it, and we'll compare answers and continue. So we start with the keyword class, then give the class name, capital P person, open and close curlies, our first property is var, lower camel case first name, colon string, uninitialized, and our second one is var, lower camel case last name, colon string, and then we'll write our initializer down below. If we just start to type in init, we can see code completion wants to write the rest, press return, all done. Now let's use that initializer to create an object of the person class. We say var, we'll call our object lowercase person, we'll set this equal to capital P person. We see code completion offers the option to create a class with our two property values. That's our initializer going to work with the two values included in the class initializer above. So we'll press return to accept this, and why don't we say that the first name is Christopher and the last name is Wallace. Now, if I want to print out the individual element of the person object, I can use dot notation. Down below, I'll say print in between parens and double quotes, string interp, space string interp. And in between the first string interp, I can enter lowercase person, our object name. Dot notation knows there are two properties here. I'll select first name, then head over to the second string interp, and I'll say person dot last name. Shift return to run, and I see a name made up of the two properties of person printed below. And those of you in the know might know that Christopher Wallace is one of Brooklyn's finest. If not, let's provide a little bit of hip hop history. And while doing so, we'll illustrate how reference types work. Now, if I create a new variable wrapper and set this equal to person, and then create a similar print line like the one above, but this time I'll print out wrapper.firstName, wrapper.lastName, and shift return, I see two Christopher Wallaces, no surprise. But then, ladies and gentlemen, around 1994, an album named Ready to Die drops. And from this point forward, the world knows rapper.firstName equals Biggie and rapper.lastName equals Smalls. But now here's what happens when reference types are at work. Rapper was set equal to person. This means that person and rapper now point to the same data holding location in memory. So below, we'll print out a blank line. Then we'll print out person's first and last name and rapper's first and last name. We'll expect rapper to be Biggie Smalls, but oh, when we shift return, we see our person is Biggie Smalls as well. That's a reference type in action. If objects are set equal to each other, they both point to the same data holding location in memory. Changing 
a property in one will also have that new value used by all values that also point to that reference. In fact, we can show this in action again. This time we'll change person's first name to the notorious and the last name to B-I-G. Copy and paste the lines that print the first and last names for both of these objects and both person and wrapper are now the notorious B-I-G. Now, reference types might seem weird and even dangerous, especially if you think you're changing only one value, but it impacts others. Well, reference types are precisely what we want with Swift data. We want to have one source of truth, so to speak, for our data, and a change in any one view or screen will impact all others. That's going to work out great for us, but we'll also see that there's another way to create custom data types in Swift. In a future lesson, we're going to cover structs. At that point, we'll see structs are value types, so each individual struct we create is going to work independently of any of the others. You already use Apple structs every time you work with different types of views, and we'll learn how to create our own custom structs, but we don't need them now, so we'll put structs on hold for a bit. Now, there are also a few more concepts we can introduce with classes, especially around initialization and inheritance, but we don't want to overload too much while we're focusing on Swift data, so let's stop here, and in the next lesson, we'll use what we just learned about classes to begin the process of creating an app that can save and modify data. Stay classy, my Swifty friends. Word to your objects.